Namaskar and a very warm welcome to everyone joined in today on our week 61st Know Your Species, Know Your Zoo talk. This talk is being organized by the Central Zoo Authority New Delhi as part of the ongoing Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav. The Mahotsav is a 75 week long celebration to commemorate 75 years of India's independence, which falls on the 15th of August 2022. The Central Zoo Authority is taking this celebration forward through a massive outreach campaign entitled Conservation to Coexistence The People Connect. Under the helm of this campaign, we will be showcasing 75 conservation priority species and 75 zoos, highlighting one species and one zoo each week. We are currently in week 61 of this celebration with the Himalayan Goral as the species in focus and the Dehradun Mini Zoo as the zoo in focus. So join in today to speak to us on the species is Dr. Tapajit Bhattacharya. Dr. Tapajit is Assistant Professor in the PG Department of Conservation Biology at the Durgapur Government College, West Bengal. Dr. Bhattacharya has carried out his doctoral research on the mountain ungulates in Himalayas and has and was formerly working as the project scientist in the Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, and as technical officer in the Wildlife Trust of India, Noida. Throughout his career, Dr. Tapajit has been part of several uh, research projects on the mammals and birds in the Himalayan region. He will speak to us today more on our species and focus for today. So over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Uh, now I will share my screen and start the presentation. Okay, is it visible? Not yet, sir. Now the screen is visible. Yes, it's visible, sir. We could just put it in presentation mode. Yes. Okay. Fine. Thank you so much, madam. A very good afternoon to all of you. Today, I will start with this iconic photograph taken by the legendary wildlife biologist, Dr. AJT John Singh in Rajaji National Park. This perfect photograph kindled curiosity for mountain ungulates in the minds of young researchers at that time. I was one of them. After many long years, one automatic triggered camera trap somewhere near the origin of the Holy River Ganga, taken this photograph of the same species with equal elegance. This is the Himalayan Goral, the common mountain ungulate in the Himalayan range from Kistwar to Kajinath, from Rajaji to Gangotri, even from Kanchenjunga to Tawa. But unfortunately, very few people in the vast plain of the Indian subcontinent actually are aware of the very existence of this particular species. Today, we will discuss some biological facets of this particular species. Before going to the main topic, I would like to discuss about the taxonomic position of this particular species. They are kept under the tribe Rupicaprini. Rupicaprins are goat antelopes. They are neither as stockily built as the goats, not they have the long legs of antelopes, but they have the they has the preorbital gland, which is rudimentary in case of goral, very much developed in case of saro and chamois. And uh, this rupicaprini originated in the Central Asian highland around four to five million years ago. Then uh, chamois came to Europe through river and ridges, and Rocky Mountain goat started their journey towards the North American highlands through Siberian pathway. And these two genus, Goral and Saro, Nemohrodus and Capricornis, stayed in Asia. There are four species of Goral under the genus Nemohrodus. These are Red Goral, Long tailed Goral, Chinese Goral, and the Himalayan Goral. The Red Goral is found in the northeastern trip of uh, Arunachal Pradesh and the adjoining area in China. Long tailed Goral is not at all present in India. It is distributed in the Southeast Asian countries and Chinese Goral is present in the eastern part of the Brahmaputra River that is in Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram, Manipur, Nagaland in this, and Meghalaya. The most widespread of these Goral species is the Himalayan Goral. It is present in Pakistan somewhere here and from Jammu Kashmir to at a stretch up to Arunachal Pradesh till Brahmaputra, it has a wide distribution range. 
coming to the morphological features of the Himalayan goral, if you want to identify the species, just look for this white patch at the throat here. This is the very conspicuous feature of this species. If you are watching any mountain ungulate with such a white throat patch, be sure that you are watching a Himalayan goral. Now, this is a monomorphic cliff dwelling solitary mountain ungulate. You cannot distinguish between male and female unless and until you have a very close watch because both the sexes have similar type of horn shape and size. Their body size is also similar and their body color is also similar. They are medium size mountain ungulates. They weigh 35 to 42 kilogram and old males are usually solitary. Otherwise, they live in very small groups of 3 to 5 or 4 to 12. Maximum aggregation was reported from Majatal Wildlife Sanctuary, that is 13. Their diet consists of grasses, leaves, twigs and nuts. And the main predators of gorals are toll, leopard, lynx, tiger, marten and wolf. Toll is very much present in Himalaya, both in eastern as well as western Himalaya. Whereas in recent years, we have photographic evidences of tiger presence in both eastern and western Himalaya. There are two subspecies present in uh, India in, for uh, Himalayan goral. They are brown goral and grey goral. Now, how can you, you distinguish between these two subspecies? In case of grey goral, the dark dorsal streak, this one, it is not beyond the width. You cannot see any dark strip here. But in case of the brown goral, this dark dorsal strip is quite continuous up to the root of the tail. This is the main distinguishing feature between the brown goral and the grey goral. And uh, in Envis Mountain Angular, Dr. Satya Kumar wrote that the subspecies Nemorhidus goral bedfordi, that is the grey goral, and Nemorhidus goral goral, the brown goral, are apparently separated by Nepal. That means the former, the grey goral, occur only in Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. And in Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh, you can find the brown goral. So these are the two subspecies and the distribution. Now coming to the distribution of this very species, specifically in case of northwestern Himalaya. In case of Pakistan, it is widely distributed from 500 meter to 3000 meter in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa area. And in Chitra area, in Margalla National Park, all these areas have goral. Very recently, presence of goral was established in Kajinag National Park of Baramula area. And it is present from Kistwa to towards the Himachal Pradesh. From the 500 meter to 3300 meter, all the areas, all the forested areas and open grassy patches have goral presence in northwestern Himalaya. Similarly, in case of biogeographic zone 2B, that is the western Himalaya, in case of Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, we found a continuous distribution of goral, Himalayan goral throughout, throughout the Himalayan ranges from lower area up to the upper reaches of snowy mountains. In this particular area, you can see that the goral uh, distribution is touching the Himalayan, trans Himalayan area. This is because of the subtlage gap. Here, the altitude is uh, very favorable for goral to inhabit. Same is the case in the Bhagirathi Basin also. Here also it is touching the trans Himalayan portion. But in the central Himalaya, in case of Sikkim, the IUCN extent range is showing that it is uh, very much present in the cold deserts of Sikkim or northern areas of Sikkim. But uh, I personally visited all these areas and uh, did camera trapping for almost two years. But I never found any evidence of Goral beyond the tree line. I mean, say more than 4000 meters. They have never invert, uh, invaded in the cold desert areas of Sikkim. So they are not present in this cold desert area. Their distribution is along the forest ridge line. In case of Arunachal Pradesh, the Himalayan Goral is constricted up to the Brahmaputra River or Sangpo. Beyond that, the eastern part of this is the territory of Chinese Goral and Red Goral. The Himalayan Goral is constricted up to Brahmaputra. So this is the distribution of goral in Himalayan goral in India. The population and abundance of this particular species. This is a very tricky question. How you can measure the abundance of uh, such a solitary mountain ungulate? In case of Western Himalaya, we all did the Vantage 
point based scan count because here goral prefers the open grassy slopes you can see how many individuals are there and you can count but here also the inclusion of detection probability and calculation of the total scan area is a problematic issue however these are these are the statistics reported by several scientists in different time starting from kedarnath sanctuary in from, by michael green in 1987 dr satya kumar in 1994 and uh, lovari and apollonio in three himachal pradesh sanctuary these are the estimates they have given but in case of eastern himalaya no such open spaces are available for population and abundance estimation of any type of mountain angulars in eastern himalaya we did camera trapping and we used the photo capture rate the relative abundance indices and we found that the photo capture mind that i am using the word capture here that means photograph taken after one hour gap not continuous photographs of the same species so i have such 216 captures of goral and it is showing very de definitely that gorals were most abundant in the temperate region rather than in subalpine region we also did the pellet root density estimation from the indirect evidences such as pellet and we found that among all other forested mountain angulars, goral was the most abundant animal in Panchenjaga biosphere reserve in eastern Himalaya. We also tried to include the detection probability in our relative abundance estimation and using occupancy modeling, I did the Royal Nichols heterogeneity model and I found that the density of goral in a particular area, 100 kilometers square area, say 21 individual per 100 square kilometer in eastern Himalaya. But we need to carry out some sophisticated analytical tools like distance sampling with camera traps or double observed sampling to get the precise estimate of coral abundance in eastern Himalaya. Coming to the habitat use of the species, habitat selection by Goral was very vividly studied by Misra and John Singh in 1996 in Majatal Harsang Wildlife Sanctuary of Himachal Pradesh. Here, they depicted Goral preferred open community forest, like open pine community forest, open oak pine community forest, and they avoided the dense pine forest. All these dense forests were avoided. At the same time, they preferred very steep slopes, 31 to 40 degree and more than 50 degree. So they are cliff dwelling. And they preferred very less shrub cover, 0 to 20 and shrub height 0 to 0 0.50. So their observation, the so steep open grassy slopes interspersed with cliffs and forest cover for escape are important habitat requirement of coral. In Western Himalaya, in Gangotri region, we did the camera trap and we found coral presence in similar habitats. This is the grassy slopes interspersed with forest that is the escape terrain and goral use this particular area very frequently but in case of eastern himalaya no such grassy slopes are present they are all forest so here we did the one Fironi confidence interval test and we found that the elevation class of 2000 to 3000 meter is most preferred by goral and they here also they are preferring the 30 to 40 degrees steep slope and most of the goral presence was recorded inside the wet temperate forest, not beyond that. Coming to the occupancy modeling, we wanted to know what are the factors that goral, that, that are influencing goral to select such habitats. We did occupancy modeling with these uh, site variables and detection variables. We have tree cover, elevation, aspect in two categories, warm aspect and uh, cooler aspect, presence and absence of trekking trail. Presence and the conifer forest, broadleaf forest, and steep and gentle slope categories. For detection of goral, we use two detection variables: presence or absence of human signs and rainy or dry season. The top occupancy model suggested that gorals are preferring areas with high tree percentage and where trekking trail is absent, where cooler aspect is absent. And for detection of goral, human presence is negatively correlated. When we dig deeper into the microhabitat characteristics and their relation with goral, we found that in the temperate zone, gorals are preferring areas with high herb density and shrub density. And in subalpine zone, they are preferring areas with high canopy cover and high grass density. So barren areas, high herb density, high 
thrust density, these are very important for borer. Well, if we want to know this, you have to look at the diet. Very fortunately, we have information of coral diet from three of all the biogeographic zones and inside the range of coral distribution. The first one is from the Western Himalaya, studied by again Ms. Ryan Johnson in 1996. And they found that coral fed largely on grass. Graminoids, that means grass, constituted more than 90% both in winter as well as in summer. However, finding of Ria Jaman and uh, Dar et al. 2021, from Kajinag National Park, they showed that the Himalayan coral is a pleasure 72.66%, but the proportion of grey items showed a sharp decline from spring to winter, and it is shifted towards the browse. Similar findings were reported from Eastern Himalaya by Srivastava in 2019. In her thesis, she wrote that although graminoids form the highest proportion of its diet, Tychors also formed a large percentage in all seasons, with the proportion exceeding that of graminoids in winter. So, in winter, in both the places in Kajinab as well as in uh, Sikkim Himalaya in Kyongosna National Park, corals are shifting their diet from graminoids to tychors. Avasti et al. 2003 has compiled all the information provided by the researcher about the plants preferred or palatable plant species for Himalayan coral, and these are the species. These includes uh, Indian balsam, indigo, many important plants such as oregano and rubus, that is the raspberry, very favorite uh, for fruit for uh, Asiatic black pear, and medicinal plants like Virginia, cocon breath, etc. So these are the palatable plant species of Himalayan coral as depicted by the researchers throughout the years. Coming to the behavior part of uh, Himalayan coral, they are single occurring species, sometimes in groups or pairs of three to five. Largest reported uh, aggregation is 13 individuals from Majatal Wildlife Sanctuary and Binodan Satyakumar reported 12 individuals from Great Himalayan National Park in 1999. But their aggregation solely depends on the food resource availability and the distribution. Corals are active during the early morning and late, at late afternoons and rest of the day they take rest under the overhanging rocks. When approached by any predator or human, coral makes an hiss sound and run for the escape cover. But while running, they can stop and they can look back. That I have personally seen in the field. Like this, he, this is the alert position and they are grazing by three. Activity of coral was first studied by Cavallini in 1992, again in Majatal Harsang Wildlife Sanctuary in Himachal Pradesh. And he inferred that no coral was seen active between 8 to 16 30 hours. You can see in this graph, all these three are R. R means resting. After 8 a.m., there is no such activity of coral. It is started again after 16 30. This is the peak. So he presumed that this suggests a crepuscular and possibly also nocturnal activity. When we did camera trapping in Kanchenjunga Biosphere Reserve in the eastern Himalaya, we found, we calculated the daily activity index of two hour duration, that is the number of photographs within two hour into 100 divided by total number of photographs. We found a peak in four, at the 4 a.m., just before sunrise. And it is confirmed that the species can be found during daytime as well as night. It has a peak also during night at 8, 8 to 10. So, Goral showed an early morning activity peak at four to six hours. The behavior of Goral was uh, also vividly studied by Loverian Apollonio, that is the rutting behavior, and they identified 27 qualitatively different behavioral patterns, including visual, auditory, and olfactory cues. And these are the photographs, hand-drawn photographs of all these activities, including approach, body shake, this is the poop touch, and this is the gentle flank stroke, and this is the hard front kick, Head butt, which is very common among, among all the mountain ungulates. And this is the head up, hook or jerk position. This is lip curl. This is low stretch. And this is the nasonasal contact and nasogenital contact. Also, rush. These are all the behavioral features that he, they had noted from coral rutting behavior. Coming to the threats of this particular species, 
Duckworth and McKinnon were the assessor of the IUCN red list for coral. They observed that the most significant threat to coral is the severe habitat disturbance and alteration, where particularly in the lower portion of Himalaya and the northeastern India. In this particular photograph from Devprayar, you can see the gorals are playing around a human made structure, concrete structure. And this type of habitat alteration through grass burning, fill the habits of high cars, livestock grazing, and forest cutting, they alter the species composition of particular coral habitat. And what can be the consequences? In eastern Himalaya, I have seen all these, I have collected all these photographs. These are the dead gorals for dermatitis. According to Dr. Madan K. S. Shankar, the then deputy director of Kanchenjunga National Park, he said that this is the cause of dermatitis and this is due to deficiency of minerals and deficiency of essential food items in coral habitat. And that can also be borne by ectoparasites, fungal and necrotic disease. So this type of diseases can be, can be very harmful for coral population. In this particular photograph, you can observe that the horns are missing. Actually, when we went to, to the field to take these photographs, the horns were already missing. Some, somebody took them. Why? That is the answer. One preprint from Adhikari et al. from Nepal, they showed that the horn of Himalayan goral can be used as a traditional medicine as this can be rubbed and made a fine paste and can be used in the navel region for curing the stomach pain. So, there is a demand for the horns of gorals as a traditional medicine. Apart from this, traditional hunting using traps and snares for local consumption and presence of dogs inside the national park and protected areas are also very threat to the survival of this particular species. To summarize all these uh, things, Himalayan goral is a monomorphic leaf dwelling goat antelope that occurs singly or pairs in a small group of three to five individuals. They occur along a wide elevation range from 500 meter to 4000 meter and they are present in all the six Himalayan states in various habitats. They are most active just before the sunrise and also shows nocturnal activities. Himalayan grazer, Himalayan goral is mainly a grazer. It depends on graminoids. However, during the lean season, it can consume dicots. As a common and relatively abundant prey to common leopard and other mesocarnivores, this particular animal plays a pivotal role in the mid altitude ecology in Himalaya. Habitat alteration, disease, and hunting for local conservation are the major threats for the survival of Himalayan goat. These are the references I have used for this particular presentation and I want to pay my sincere gratitude to the organizer for uh, inviting me in this lecture and uh, I want to acknowledge Dr. Satya Kumar in WII, Dr. Rawat, Dr. John Singh, Dr. Goel, Dr. Radhikari, Dr. Rahul Paul in WTI for letting me there for the student and to learn from them and uh, thanks to all my colleagues in WII and in Durgapur Government College for helping me to prepare this presentation. Thank you. But before ending, I want to show you that uh, these are the photographs of the same place that is called Rambara. It is a very famous pilgrimage place in on the way to Kedarnath. Just across the river, there are tens and thousands of uh, pilgrims. They are continuing their journey. And uh, during the day and night, all these wild animals are coexisting in this very place. I have kept Goral in the center, but uh, all of them are staying in the harmony. Their need is just to keep this habitat intact. Let it be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tapaji, for concising the entire uh, species biology of our uh, of the Himalayan goral, as well as highlighting the conservation concerns that major conservation concerns that are there for the species. We will take question answers for this session towards the end. We now move on to uh, the second part of today's talk, which is on Know Your Zoo. So joined in today to speak to us on the zoo is Mr. Prasanna Patro, who is the director of the Radun Mini Zoo. So Mr. Patro is an Indian Forest Service officer of the 2003 batch from the Uttarakhand cadre. Mr. Patro is the chief conservator of forest and the director of the Dehradun Zoo at the same time. And he has been involved in the management and welfare of the animals and the zoo since 2015. He will speak to us today more on the zoo in focus. So over to you, sir. I will share your presentation. Thank you, Arundhati. Please share the presentation.
So is it visible? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So just tell me when to change. Yeah. Before starting uh, my presentation, uh, I would like to express my gratitude and thankfulness to Mr. Tapajit Bhattacharya uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and I also learn a lot about this Gural species. Uh, otherwise, this is not a so charismatic species uh, as we know in India. But uh, when I gone through the uh, the information uh, about this Goral, then it is uh, somehow threatened species enlisted in uh, IUC in uh, the list appendix one. Uh, actually, uh, most in India. Uh, the conservation is mostly focused on this some few species. It is concentrated all these efforts concentrated on a few species only. And I am thankful to CJ Day to select uh, Dehradun Zoo for this important species. So then uh, now uh, I am going to start my presentation. Yeah, next please. Yeah, this is uh, the milestone of the Dehradun Zoo. Earlier, uh, it is a very small place in Dehradun, the capital city of Uttarakhand. So before formation of Uttarakhand uh, in uh, UP uh, state, uh, this place was known as Malsi Deer Park. And uh, the WIH researchers, students, scientists, the IFS professionals in Dehradun, they must visit this place uh, for uh, some study, some uh, to see how the animals should not be presented or placed. So this was the uh, basically the uh, that was the uh, status of that uh, Malsi Deer Park earlier. It was formed in 1976. Then in 2012, uh, it was uh, the CJD given the status of mini zoo to this place. And uh, the master layout plan and many things happened since 2014. Then in 2014, this place was renamed this Malsi Deer Park as a Dehradun Zoo. The present status is a mini zoo. Then uh, for the management, uh, this Dehradun Zoo, one Dehradun Zoo Management Society was uh, established, formed. And now the day to day management is under this society. And since the uh, the formation of Dehradun Zoo, uh, I am a person who from 2015, I am looking up to this zoo. Okay, so uh, almost 360 degree work I have done in this zoo. That is from starting from the recognition, getting recognition uh, of status of mini zoo to the formation of society and uh, the preparation of master plan. All these things happen uh, during this uh, period. It is a no doubt. It is a very uh, it is a very small zoo with a very less uh, uh, collection of animal species. But uh, I am continuing starting from uh, my position as a DFO Dehradun to at present I am CCF. So many people ask uh, how the CCF can hold the charge of director uh, of a small mini zoo or a small zoo. So actually, this is the decision, maybe wise decision or. I don't know what is the decision of the government that uh, their view was to continue a person who started this zoo for the for establishment of this zoo till the uh, completion of the all the expansion plan of this zoo that is that perhaps the main objective of the government to continue me as a director there are zoo so this there are zoo it is a iso 9001 and 14001 compliance zoo uh, two times we renew this compliance. Uh, next, please. Yeah, this is the some uniqueness of this project. This place was it is a very unknown place in uh, Dehradun. Now it is one of the most popular destination in the city. So earlier it is before 2014 the visitors number was two lakhs. Now it is 6.5 lakhs. It is pre-COVID uh, figure. The revenue we used to get around 25 lakh rupees per year, and now reached up to 2.4, 2.5 crore rupees per year. Earlier, this entire zoo was dependent on the government phones only, as uh, many Jews uh, used to have this problem. 
so after the formation of this society now we are self sufficient so we are not we are receiving a very small amount from the government exchequer and now we are managing our financial resource of the society for the management of the jew so this is one of the unmanaged most un unmanaged place uh, deer park so now it is one of the good managed zoo and uh, yesterday the member secretary cj day uh, he visited this zoo he appreciated he is wrote uh, a note in the visitors book so this is the achievement of this uh, place uh, now it is uh, one of the good place for education awareness and research and all so next please yeah this is the collection animal and bird collection we have uh, 21 species of birds four species of deer species turtles and tortoise we have seven species this is all our local species the found in uttarakhand reptiles uh, we have crocodiles gharials then 11 species of snakes and uh, cats we have only leopards uh, and we have some other attraction also that is we have a very good aquarium and a small 3d theater also we have small adventure activities and cactus garden this cactus garden contains about it is a collection of three, around 300 species of cactus and succulents and in aquarium we have around 37 uh, varieties of fish uh, display uh, next please So this is the uh, current management uh, practice for day-to-day -day management. Uh, uh, it is managed under uh, by the Dehradun Zoo Management Society, and to standardize the manage management uh, of the zoo, we have this uh, ISO standards that is ISO 9001 and 14001 for environmental managements. And uh, for future management plan, we have already. Uh, this is it. I have to please to uh, approve our master plan with a few suggestions. Uh, and uh, we have also for financial sustainability, we also take uh, help from the society. And to involve the society, we have this adaptation plan, adoption plan, animal adoption plan. Next, please. So I think uh, Dehradun Zoo, though it is a very small mini zoo. Uh, we have the zoo which have its own environmental sustainability management plan, environmental management plan. I think in India, I think this is the zoo where we have our own environmental management plan, approved management plan. And uh, we fixed the targets uh, like sustainable use of sustainable energy, solid waste management, liquid waste management rainwater harvesting, all these green activities we have identified, we fixed our target and we are trying to fix, we're trying to achieve the targets of these green initiatives. And for that we are using CSR and under this we have already uh, uh, implemented three CSR project, a very small, small project, 50 lakhs, 20 lakhs, 30 lakhs projects. And uh, 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 one uh, big project is that the Gale India he supported they supported for this uh, for sustainable energy. So we installed almost 65 kilowatt of solar energy in our uh, zoo, and uh, uh, we are uh, we are into, into into the process to make the entire zoo a green zoo, uh, having zero carbon footprint. This is our big uh, objective and ambition. Next, please. Uh, this is the ISO certificate. Next, please. Yeah, for solid waste management, this is another big channel in, uh, challenge in most of the Jews. Uh, as we, as I told you that uh, we received almost 6.5 lakh visitors per year. So the solid waste management, particularly the uh, that is the pet bottles, plastics. All these are big challenge for the Jew. So we developed our own uh, management strategy. That is, we call it as a three R strategy, reduce, re recycle and reuse strategy. So, 
and uh, we use the, we are using this we are practicing this strategy since 2015 16 and uh, i can say it is a sustainable model uh, because till date uh, we are uh, successfully managing all these uh, solid waste uh, uh, the plastics and all non biodegradable uh, items coming to the zoo so this is one of the best achievement i can say and uh, most of the visitors they appreciate the cleanness of this zoo neatness and cleanness of this zoo and all the technical people who are visiting who are into the field of conservation wildlife conservation environmental conservation so they appreciate these things uh, very much this uh, the cleanness and the solid waste management practice we are using in the zoo next please this is a three hour management practice we are doing. Next one. Next, please. Yeah, we use this pet block, pet bottles, water bottles, basically these water bottles, leftover water bottles. We are using for different uh, items. Next one, please. Yeah, some of the animal housing we are we are making this animal housing for by using these plastic bottles and styrofoams and on many non biodegradable items next please yeah these are the some of the souvenirs we are trying to develop so that we can generate some revenue out of this waste waste materials next please uh, the honorable governor she visited this zoo. Yeah, next please. Yeah, we have uh, social media footprint also. We have uh, we are active in Facebook. We are managing it a very professional way. We are active in Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, every day there is some posting regarding this conservation environment and all these such related activities next please regarding this is the one of the major mandate of any zoo so that is the education and awareness so now the student researchers from various institutes they are visiting this zoo to study different aspects of this management no doubt we don't have much number of animals or variety of animals but uh, like the solid waste management environmental management practice the animal welfare practice all uh, kind of thing, things they are actually studying in uh, deradun zoo next please we are also active in a social arena so this is one such example this is one of the uh, important event happened unfortunate event happened in india so here also we have dedicated one day collection of the zoo to this prime minister's uh, relief fund for uh, uh, in for that occasion yeah next please this is our future expansion plan as per our approved uh, that is a master layout plan. So we are planning to acquire this uh, have tiger, uh, black bear, sloth bear, then uh, jackal, fox, hyena, primates, four variety of primates, one uh, nocturnal house interpretation center, fossil park. All these things are in the approved master layout plan. Next, please. This is our aquarium and a 3d theater next please this is our collection cactus garden very small but we have around 350 species of cactus and succulents next please yeah this is the changed view of the radunju and uh, you can see some old photographs how earlier the Malsi deer park was there and now it's uh, Change the image. Next one, please. Next, please. 
yeah thank you very much uh, this is all about the rabun zoo as i told you that uh, this is very small zoo we don't have much to showcase we don't have any research program we don't have any conservation breeding program in the rabun zoo but uh, still people like uh, this zoo very much i don't know why uh, yesterday also the member secretary he visited and uh, when he when he appreciated the things i have asked one question that uh, why you like this zoo uh, because you have seen almost all zoos in the country some big zoos with a number of species he told me one thing that uh, this zoo is a very small zoo compact small and beautiful so this is this was uh, his comment uh, with all cleanness and greenery landscaping animal enclosures and uh, the enrichment part all things are some of the beautiful things that we have uh, developed in the dehradun zoo thank you very much thank you so much sir for uh, for showcasing the dehradun mini zoo to the audience along with you know the kind of work that has gone into making it what it is today Uh, we will now move on to the question and answer session for today's talk. So, Dr. Tapaji, are you there? We will take questions for the species section first. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. So, sir, the first question for you is that can you explain a bit on the scan count method, uh, scan count based density method that was used for the species, uh, species population estimation in the Western Himalayas? Okay. A scan count is a method that is done from a vantage point. Uh, the observer is one slope and he is observing the slope just in front of him where there is an open grassy patch grassy patch and you can see all the animals clearly and you have to identify and calculate the total area of the scan that you are doing so you have the area and now you you can count the animals i mean the individuals then you can just divide the number of individuals by the area and you will get the density but the problem is we are assuming that we are detecting all the animals that we are watching we don't know whether any anyone is just behind the rock or just behind the shadow or just behind the tree so the inclusion of detection probably is a problem for scan count this is uh, the scan count in a nutshell okay. right thank you sir uh, the next question for you is that are there any transboundary projects for the species in uh, place right now or there be anything has been planned for the species conservation given its distribution range for western himalaya no no such thing as far as i know because the transboundary area is uh, i mean goral is the least concern for uh, all the issues in western frontier but uh, for nepal and sikkim there is a total kanchenjunga conservation area for nepal and kanchenjunga biosphere reserve in sikkim ic mode has some programs that is but uh, goral is not the focus there all the animals present in this landscape are in the focus that is the transboundary thing that is happening in eastern himalaya right sir and so the next question for you is that goral seems to have a specific uh, habitat preference based on it, or based on its distribution what advice would you give to zoo managers who house the species with regard to the feeding and environment enrichment if there's anything that you can uh, comment on this keep the natural diet that is the only advice i can give i mean have the list of the plant species and try to provide those only right sir so those were the questions for you we will now move on to questions uh, for mr patra sir uh, the sir. first yes uh, so the first question for you is that um, what uh, what is the inspiration uh, what is the inspire what is the future inspire uh, sorry What is sorry? What is the one thing that you consider most important in maintaining an environmentally uh, sustainable zoo? Given that there are several models such as energy, water, and waste, which form an important factor in you know environment uh, sustainability, what do you think is the one factor that would be the first thing to address when a zoo starts its journey towards being an environment towards being a sustainable green institution? Yeah, my answer is very simple. Your intention matters much. Okay. if you have intention that uh, like dehradun uh, zoo whenever when we have started our uh, this uh, reconstruction or redevelopment work from the beginning we have in our mind that uh, we should address all such kind of issues 
okay so our our intention was very much clear after that only in 2016 17 then we have our we have developed our uh, environmental management plan we approved those plans then uh, we contacted uh, many ngos uh, and many uh, this public sector uh, companies for funding because all these kind of things it is not much encouraged in government sector you will not get much budget or supportive uh, things from the government sectors so you have to find uh, the other source of your investment okay fix your target have a clear intention what you are going to do what you are going to give to the tourist because it is a zoo uh, means we used to think that uh, we have to take care of the animals and the visitors okay and we have to give uh, the education and awareness part about the animals but it is something larger than our objective okay so we have we are uh, we are holding a place where many people from different categories of people are coming like a different age group different uh, uh, economic strata people every many people are coming researchers students so we have to address all those things all the, all those parts of the society okay for that they should we should we should have we, we should, uh, in our zoo our zoo should have uh, all kind of things uh, ingredient of all those things should uh, composition of a zoo okay this is my thought all right and so the next uh, question for you is uh, are there any uh, are there any uh, future plans for uh, establishing any conservation breeding uh, for the of himalayan species yeah till date we don't have any kind of uh, plan but uh, with uh, uh, assistance from cza and uh, guidance from the wai and all we love to have some conservation breeding program in our zoo you are in oh, mute sorry sorry yes i thank you so much sir, for answering that i think those were the questions that we received for today's talk and with this we come to the conclusion of our week 61 know your species know your zoo talk so on behalf of the central zoo authority i would like to thank both dr tapajit and team mr patru for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us for this talk and i would also like to thank the audience who have been with us throughout and i hope you have taken more on the himalayan goral and the dehradun mini zoo uh we will be back next week uh, with our week 62 talk which is on the uh, indian monjack or the barking deer and the zone focus for the week is pandit govin pandit govin bala pant high altitude zoo nanital so do tune in for that talk next wednesday from 4 to 5 pm and in the meantime there are the mini zoo will be continuing their outreach activities till the end of this week so do visit the zoo if you are in dehradun and take part in them thank you so much once again for joining us for this talk namaskar thank you thank you thank you so much Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.